Now there are several bad things that happen when voltage drops below 20. One of the things happens is that things begin to hurt. So when your voltage is low, you simply hurt all the time. And so pain is simply a symptom of low voltage. So if you have pain, you automatically know that the thing has low voltage. You don't need to do any fancy tests. You just know it because that's the way it works. If you have pain, you have the low voltage. Another thing that's bad about having low voltage is that it controls the level of oxygen that's available. So if I take a glass of water and I put a tube in it and I start bubbling oxygen into that water, the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in the water is dictated by the voltage of the water. So if the voltage is higher, more oxygen goes into solution. But if the voltage drops, oxygen comes out of solution and leaves the water. Well, our cells are 70% water. So when the voltage in a cell begins to drop, the oxygen comes out of the cell. And now the cell has to get by with an adequate amount of oxygen. Well, that creates a couple of other problems. One of them has to do with metabolism. We have a system inside the cells that generates the energy for the cells to do their work. So insert um, fat into one side of what's called the Krebs cycle, and what comes out the other side is a rechargeable battery called ATP. And ATP uh, provides the electrons necessary for all the enzymes and so forth for your cell to do whatever it needs to do. So, uh, and then ATP discharges into a, di a discharged rechargeable battery called ADP. Well, the point that I'm making is that when you put fat into the Krebs cycle and you have oxygen available, you get 38 molecules of ATP out the other side, lots of energy. However, if oxygen is not available, for every unit of fat you put in, you only get two molecules of ATP. So when oxygen levels drop, you go from 38 miles to the gallon to two miles to the gallon, so to speak. Well, when you're running at two miles to the gallon, it's hard for the cell to have enough energy to do its job, isn't it? Another problem that happens is that, <clears throat> um, is that um, each of us contain perhaps as many as a trillion bugs. And those bugs are asleep as long as oxygen is available. However, if oxygen becomes unavailable, the oxygen levels drop, those bugs wake up. And when they wake up, they want to have lunch. And if they want to have you for lunch, and so they, since they don't have teeth to bite into your cells, they put out digestive enzymes so they can dissolve your cells and get the nutrients out of them. So the, one of the problems is that those bugs having lunch not only are damaging the tissue right around them, but those enzymes get in our bloodstream and go to distant places and damage cells there as well. So for example, if I have strep throat, I've got a strep bacteria having lunch on my tonsil. Now to me, when he's having lunch, I'm kind of uh, annoyed about it because it hurts like crazy, right? I've got a strep throat. Well, we all know that the enzymes that the strep put, puts out while it's having a picnic on my tonsil can get in my bloodstream and go down and scar my heart valves, right? Call that rheumatic heart disease. It comes from strep bugs having lunch on your tonsil. Those same things can go down and damage my knees as well, uh, you know, rheumatic arthritis. Well, the same process goes on throughout the body. So I may have low voltage in my gallbladder and the bugs that are in there having lunch on the gallbladder put out toxins uh, that commonly damage the brain. So the reason my brain isn't working very well be because I got low voltage in my gallbladder. You see how that works? So. Whenever you hear somebody say you have an autoimmune disease, well, I don't believe there is such a thing as an autoimmune disease. I think it's just bugs having lunch and these enzymes going someplace causing damage. And when we go biopsy that area, we see damage. We see inflammatory cells, but we can't culture anything there. So we say, oh, the body's attacking itself. No, the body's not attacking itself. These enzymes that the bugs are putting out are attacking it. And one of the reasons I can say that with some confidence is I've taken a fair number of people that have a lupus with a high blood test called ANA, which diagnoses lupus. You go in and raise the voltage, kill the bugs, and the ANA goes back to normal, and the people get well. So, so it's my belief, then, that these things we call autoimmune diseases are simply low voltage, low oxygen, bugs having lunch, enzymes going places and causing grief.
So, so then, as of course, if voltage gets low enough, then one of the bugs that begins to grow are uh, fungal uh, bugs, which you can actually see in the blood with a with a uh, phase contrast or dark field microscope, and um, then those uh, fungal forms began to take over the cell, and now you have a tumor. And that occurs at plus 30 millivolts. So basically, the point is then that chronic disease is always defined by low voltage. Okay? If you've got chronic disease, you got low voltage. So that brings up some more questions. How do we measure the voltage? Um, well, Dr. Langevin, who's at the medical school in Vermont, showed that the acupuncture system is simply the fascial planes in the body. And then go down and go around every organ, and then from, every, from that capsule, there's a fiber that goes down to every little group of cells. So this fibrous network, which we know as fascia, is, is the same thing as the acupuncture system. So you can tap into that uh, and measure what's going on with any of the deep organs. And this is uh, basically Langevin's work here. And you can see here's the classical lung and large intestine meridians, and here are the actual wires in your arms. We have another system as well. Uh, there's a sheath around every nerve, which Dr. Becker named the analog perineural nervous system. And so that fiber sheath around all the nerves is the second wiring system that also carries voltage wherever we go. So all cells basically have a, a fail-safe system, two wires going to it the acupuncture system and the perineural system, so if one of them gets cut or damaged, the other one's still working. It's a pretty smart uh, guy that designed this, uh, this system we call the human, right? Well, we use primarily the acupuncture system. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that's important about this system and that ties into it is the fact that all of our muscles are both electron generators and electron storage rechargeable batteries. A piezoelectric crystal is simply, a, if you take a, a quartz crystal and squeeze it with a pair of pliers, it'll miss electrons. Well, your muscles do the same thing, so I'm now generating electrons. Well, the neat thing about not only generating them is that my muscles are rechargeable batteries, so they store those same electrons. So this is the, basically the way we are, and one of the reasons exercise is so great for us, not only does it move around the lymphatic, but, uh, but it creates and stores voltage for us to use. Then we talked about the fact there's a uh, main cable that goes up the back and down the front of the body, and uh, that's like the, the wire that comes from the telephone pole to the garage at your house. That's the main power cable. And then on each one of those, we have a terminal here uh, for each region of the body. So we have one for the skull, one for the neck and upper chest, one for the chest, one for the belly, and one for the pelvis. So if you have an illness in one of those air, you know, in whatever area that is bothering you, then you can go and you'll f indeed find that that uh, particular terminal has low voltage. So if you insert uh, electrons into that area, it will provide electrons to whatever's wrong, wh you know, whatever is chronically <coughs> ill has low voltage, and so you want to put some electrons in there, and that's the port through which you can easily do it. Why? Uh, did my voltage drop enough to allow me to get sick in the first place? Right? Because if I go out to my car and the battery's dead, and I put a battery charger on it and charge it back up, and, but I don't remember to turn the dome light off, my battery's going to be dead the next morning too, isn't it? Well, the same thing true in the body. If I don't figure out what, why my voltage dropped in the first place, even though I go fix it, it's going to be a problem again. And so we need to look and see what other things are causing the problem. Now, one of the, one of the things that's different about patients is that you can divide them into two groups, those that have normal total body voltage and those that don't. So I may have, if I measure these circuits, they may all be normal, but maybe this one, and I have a heart problem. Okay, but the rest of my circuits are all normal. Well, then that's pretty easy. All I got to do is go fix the power in that single circuit, and I'm done. But what if I measure every one of these and every one of them is low? If every one of them is low, if the total body voltage is low, then that's hypothyroidism until proven otherwise. 
So, because thyroid hormone controls both body temperature and body voltage. So I want to talk to you uh, about uh, thyroid function because most of the people in this room are hypothyroid and don't know it. Now there's this thing called metabolic syndrome X that has become the buzzword in medicine and it has uh, these four features. You have high blood pressure, apple-shaped obesity, type 2 diabetes, and increased uh, blood fats, particularly cholesterol. So this has come to be known as metabolic syndrome X because you have four things. Well, in traditional medicine, we don't really understand why people get this, so we give you pills to lower that, pills to lower that, pills to lower that, and put a band around your stomach for that. But we really didn't fix it, did we? Metabolic syndrome X is primarily a function of type 2 hypothyroidism, which is epidemic in our country. So to talk about the hypothyroidism, I need to first talk about iodine. Now, um, the important thing to know is that when you give the body iodine, the thyroid gets first dibs on it, but uh, often that's still not enough for the, the thyroid to function normally. But here's the deal. Everything, every organ in the body that secretes something needs large amounts of iodine to function normally. Okay. Now, if you look at this list, and this is just a partial list, you'll see that many people have problem in these areas, particularly, you know, women have trouble with breasts and ovaries and men with prostates and so forth. But these are where people get cancer in it. We get cancer in organs that secrete something. Now, the Japanese who consume large amounts of iodine uh, have the lowest incidence of cancer of anybody on the planet. They do have lots of stomach cancer, and that's primarily because iodine is uh, neutralized by the nitrates in the meats that they eat. But what you see is then that everybody needs lots of iodine for things to work correctly. Now, iodine will kill any single-celled organism. There isn't any bug that iodine won't kill, and the bugs can never become resistant to it, which is a neat thing. But liquid iodine is a problem in the sense that iodine doesn't like to go into solution with water. So Dr. Lugol figured out that if you put um, potassium iodide in water, then the iodine will go into solution. So water-based iodine is generally called Lugol solution. If you put it in, in alcohol, it's called tincture of iodine, which is what most of us in this room grew up buying at the drugstore and put in on cuts, right? So when you're taking iodine for the body, you don't want the alcohol, so you want to get it from Lugol's solution. Now, when you have adequate amounts of iodine in the body, the body will put 30 times as much iodine in the parts of the body exposed to the outside world as it does in the blood. So basically, you're encased in a shield of iodine. So why would the body want to do that? keeps you from getting infections, right? So that's your first line of defense in your immune system, is to have a shield of iodine in every part of the body exposed to the outside world. Now, if a bug gets past that shield, then the white blood cells will go get the bug and try to kill it by making either ozone or peroxide. So your white blood cells kill with ozone. Now, um, the uh, you can get... Uh, uh, dehydrated Lugol solution, namely they take the water out of it and just put it into pills. These are two common brands, Ithroid, Iodorol, and I find there are two or three other people who have come in the market recently with these as well. So let's go on now that we've gotten past iodine and talk a little bit about type 2 hypothyroidism. And I encourage you to get Mark Starr's book, Hypothyroidism Type 2, because it's a well-written book and explains uh, in much greater detail what I'm about to tell you. Now, up to 90% of the American population has undiagnosed hypothyroidism. And the reason is that we docs are trained to look primarily at blood tests. The pituitary gland produces thyroid-stimulating hormone, and that causes the thyroid gland to put out a hormone called T4. So we docs tend to look at those, particularly this one, and if it comes back normal, we tell you that your thyroid's working just fine. But that's just part of the story because T4 has to be converted to the active form of T3. So you can have normal TSH and normal T4, but if you can't convert it to T3, you're still hypothyroid. 
Now the conversion from T4 to T3 requires iodine, selenium, zinc, iron, progesterone, cortisol, and glutathione. And if you're missing one of these guys, you make a fake hormone called reverse T3 or RT3. The problem with RT3 is it fits in the keyhole, but it won't turn, this, turn the key, you see? And, but it takes up the spot, so T3 can't get there either. Well, many people, as, as, I, as I told you, the majority of the U.S. population is iodine deficient. The only people in the U.S. who aren't iodine deficient are those that eat seaweed every day. So everybody else is iodine deficient because you need about a thousand times what you get out of salt to be healthy. So most people don't have iodine. Many are deficient in uh, zinc and many in iron and of course a lot of people are often deficient in glutathione. So many, many people are, have normal blood tests but are still not able to make T3. Now, another reason for being <coughs> hypothyroid and that is thyroid hormone is made with iodine and iodine is a halogen, and the other halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. Here they are in the periodic table. The problem is that fluorine here is a bully. So anytime there's an atom of fluorine and an atom of any of these other guys in the same neighborhood, fluorine pushes them out of the way and takes their place. So here's T4, a protein with four iodines on it, but when you consume fluoride, you get this guy. The problem is that the blood test can't tell the difference between these two, but this one doesn't work. So every time you consume fluoride, which you do when you drink water, brush your teeth, go to the dentist, and they lather fluoride in your mouth. Soy contains large amounts of fluoride, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of sources of fluoride in our environment, unfortunately. And we end up with all this fake hormone. So you go to your doc and say, Doc, I feel terrible. I'm tired all the time. My hair's falling out. My skin is dry. I'm constipated. Uh, I have no interest in sex anymore. My GI system's a mess, and on and on and on. And he said, well, there's nothing wrong with you because your blood tests are all normal. Go home. All right? Yeah. That's the way it works. Well, it's because the blood tests miss this. You see that? Here's uh, what a normal thyroid gland looks like, and this is what fluoride does to it. So even if you t take iodine, people say to me, I'm just going to take lots of iodine and then my thyroid will start working again. Well, this thyroid gland has problems making thyroid hormone even if you've got iodine because it's too bad, too far gone. This fluoride's destroyed it. So basically, by the way, there are several things besides fluoride that will take down your, your um, thyroid function. High above those is soy, but also petrochemicals, fuel exhaust, hormones in meat and chicken, plastics. If you take a bottle of water and you leave it out in your car and then you go out after it's been hot and you drink it, you can taste the plastic. Well, well that stuff you're tasting in there is shutting down your entire endocrine system, including your thyroid. Um, sodium lauryl sulfate is uh, what's in your toothpaste. That's why, did you know there's a poison control uh, marker on toothpaste? Look at it when you get home if you didn't know that. It's because of sodium lauryl sulfate and they put it in there so it'll bubble because they sell more of it if it bubbles when you brush your teeth. Um, so um, herbicides, pesticides, and so forth, all of those things shut down thyroid function. Now, the, remember that I told you that T3 controls body temperature. 40% of T3 is used to keep your body temperature normal. 60% is used to control your body voltage. So since we can't really rely on blood tests to tell us what's going on, we rely primarily on body temperature and body voltage to tell us if you're hypothyroid. So what you want to do is put a thermometer at your bedside and when you wake up in the morning you throw the covers off and you wait about four minutes to get used to, to not being covered up and then you take your temperature. Don't do it in the mouth because dental infections and sinus infections will make that number artificially high. Do it in your armpit or my preference is to get what's called a, an exergen temporal artery thermometer and it was, they tell you to run it across your forehead. I prefer to just put it right behind your ear. You're measuring the, the blood coming right out of the heart through this artery and you don't have sweat glands behind your ear. Did you know that? So there are no sweat glands there to artificially lower it. So just put it right there, take your temperature. If it's below 97.6, you're hypothyroid. Easy, right? So 
So each of you should do that uh, tomorrow. Yeah, it's basically a degree less than what it should be in the middle of the day. 98.6 is normal in the middle of the day. If it's below 97.6 when you first wake up, you're hypothyroid. Um, the, the normal range is 97.6 to 98.2. So if, it, if, it's, uh, if you wake up in the morning and it's above 98.2, then you should uh, check your temperature again a week or so later because you may just have a little fever that was artificially bringing it up. But if you're tired all the time and have all the symptoms I was talking about all ago, and or all your voltages are low, you need to be measuring your temperature. Now, when you're hypothyroid, your body makes a goo called mucin. And mucin is a little bit like clear Cairo syrup. So your body begins to fill up with mucin. And so all of a sudden, you say, boy, I'm, just get, I'm getting fatter all the time, and there's nothing, I, I just can't get rid of all this fat. Well, oftentimes it's not fat, it's mucin. One of the ways to know is if you, you should be, you know how you can pinch your skin like this on your wrist? And you can put, pretty much put skin to skin? You should be able to do that over this muscle. And if you have significant bulk between your fingers over that muscle, that's mucin. And so that's another sign of hypothyroidism. Another one is to look at the moons. You know the little moons on your fingernails? Those moons are uh, showing you both thyroid and adrenals. If you don't have any moons, both your thyroid and your adrenals are shot. Okay? So, by the way, even young babies are born hypothyroid. If mama's hypothyroid and full of uh, fluoride and soy, if mama eats lots of soy, her baby will be hypothyroid when it's born. Uh, so even these cute fat cheek babies are often hypothyroid. Now, when your body is full of mucin, then your blood pressure goes up, trying to push blood through all of that k syrup that you're filled up with. So your blood pressure goes up. But if your adrenals fail, then your blood pressure goes down, so the, your blood pressure becomes too low. So too high a blood pressure is usually hypothyroid, too low of blood pressure is usually adrenal failure. Now, the mucin surrounds the cell membrane and makes it harder for insulin to get to the cell membrane and act, and act so oftentimes your blood sugar goes up and so you become diabetic. And you deposit a lot of the, of the mucin into your belly and so you begin to get this beer belly effect. And of course, uh, we just described um, most of uh, metabolic syndrome X. The other thing, part of metabolic syndrome X is your is high cholesterol. Now all of your hormones are made from cholesterol. So when the liver looks around and says, hmm, we don't have enough hormones, I'm gonna make some cholesterol so you guys can go back to work. So a high cholesterol is simply a symptom of you having inadequate hormones. Did you know that? And the main reason you have inadequate hormones is that you don't have thyroid because your endocrine system can't function if your thyroid's not working. And of course, if you're also consuming soy, and if also your body's full of mercury, then your endocrine glands won't work and you can't have enough, uh, your, they can't make uh, hormones and so your cholesterol continues to be elevated. So an elevated cholesterol is simply a, a response of the liver uh, whenever you don't have enough hormones. Okay, so when, you don't, when you're hypothyroid, you feel like you need a little spark, and that's why Starbucks is so, uh, is so uh, popular. People can't get going in the morning without their caffeine fix and sugar fix. And that's why so many of our kids are, uh, and even our adults are drinking these so-called power drinks or whatever you call them, these kind of uh, Red Bull kind of things that are causing our kids to have seizures and kidney failure and other problems because they're consuming such huge amounts of caffeine and sugar. Okay, so the point is that if your total body voltage is low, you should assume that that's hypothyroidism until proven otherwise and then you must go fix it. Um, most of the time, people who are hypothyroid will have to go on to thyroid medication in addition to the iodine and the things, the, all that list of things I gave you that makes it convert. Uh, 
So most of the time you have to end up finding a physician who will understand this and give you a prescription for thyroid hormones so that you can get your thyroid working again. Now there's another reason that people can have low total body voltage and that is because they don't have enough stomach acid. So let's see how that works. To make stomach acid requires our old friend iodine because guess what, the, the stomach secretes something. Everything that secretes something needs iodine, right? It has to have sodium chloride, salt, CO2, water, and vitamin B1. So if you have those things, you can make stomach acid. If you don't have one of them, you can't. Now, the way things are supposed to work is this. The human body is designed to never absorb proteins. It's only supposed to absorb amino acids. And I think most of you know you take a bunch of amino acids and you put them together and that's called a protein. So a protein is made up of amino acids. Well, you should never absorb proteins because uh, if I absorb a protein and I didn't make it, my immune system looks and says, that's not me, and so it develops antibodies and attacks it. You see that? So the way the system's supposed to work is that when you consume protein, you make stomach acid. The stomach acid tears that protein down into amino acids, and then it goes downstream, and the amino acids are absorbed, and then your body reassembles them as you. And that way you don't get allergies uh, to, uh, to these proteins. But if you don't have stomach acid, when the proteins are, go downstream and not be digested, and then they're absorbed, mm -hmm. then the body builds antibodies, and you, then you are allergic to the things that you regularly eat. So every time you eat and you absorb some of these proteins, you have a mini flu shortly after the, uh, your meal because your immune system's attacking those proteins you just ate. Do you see that? So most of the allergies people have are because they didn't have stomach acid. But there's another problem with not having stomach acid. When you make stomach acid, the wall of the stomach puts hydrochloric acid into the stomach and puts sodium bicarbonate out into the blood. Sodium bicarbonate, of course, is an electron donor. Hydrochloric acid is an electron stealer. But so basically, we put electrons out into the bloodstream every time we make stomach acid. The stomach generally gets down to a pH of about 2 if things are working correctly. And then it comes on downstream, and then once it, they, this pH of 2 stuff starts pouring into the small intestine, it has to quickly neutralize it because the small intestine is not going to put up with that kind of uh, acid, is it? And so the pancreas quickly puts sodium bicarbonate into the uh, small intestine to neutralize that stomach acid coming down. Well, in order to put bicarbonate into the gut, it has to put hydrochloric acid back into the blood. Well, that's all right as long as this, this electron donor got put in before you put this electron stealer in. But if you don't have stomach acid, you didn't put this up here, you only put this one in here, and thus you put all these electron stealers in here, it drops your body voltage. You see how that works? So one of the reasons that people have low total body voltage is they don't have stomach acid. Why don't they have stomach acid? They don't have iodine and B1. Or they're taking the notorious purple pill, right? Prilosec or Zantac or whatever, right? Those things are terrible because they are causing you to become allergic to your foods. Uh, they're causing you to have all of this uh, immune response every time you eat. And they're making your total body voltage drop. Did I explain that well enough? So it's a very, very important for you to have adequate stomach acid. So while you're building up your body, he's putting, restoring the iodine and being sure you have enough uh, B1, you need to be taking a pill called betaine, B-E-T-A-I-N-E, which causes the stomach to secrete stomach acid. And you can get those at the health food store. So you should take a betaine pill with every meal, certainly any meal that has protein in it, uh, for several months until your system gets where it can do it on its own and has it because the main reason you can't make stomach acid is you don't have iodine. All right? You see, you're beginning to see how important iodine is? People think, oh, iodine. I have a real problem in my practice. I put people on iodine. Everybody comes in, I put them on iodine. 
they'll take it for one bottle and then they quit. Well, that's not going to do it, is it? Because you have to have iodine forever. So once they get through with that bottle and they quit taking it, now they quit making stomach acid and they're right back into this old uh, system again. And so even if they avoid the foods that they're allergic to, they're <coughs> going to get allergic to the new foods because they're still not making stomach acid. So they're going to get allergic to those because they can't digest them either. Any questions about how the stomach works with this? Okay. Now I need to talk to you about dental problems. When a person comes in and their total body voltage is low, that's almost always what? Hypothyroidism or and or stomach acid. If they come in and their total body voltage is normal but they have one or two circuits that are out, They've got one or two illnesses. They got colitis. They got heart disease. Their brain doesn't work. They got one something or other. That's almost always a dental problem. Okay, and here's how that works. First of all, let me just show you a little bit of this uh, movie. I didn't hook up the. We won't worry about the sound. I can just show you what they're what we're showing in this movie is that the uh, uh, I don't know if these lights can come down any or not. Uh, Aaron, will you look and see if maybe we can shut them down? But basically this is a, uh, a mercury filling in a tooth and it has a phosphorescent screen around it, behind it, and what you can see is all this mercury f vapors coming off of it. See it? And so this happens uh, every, when you have a mercury filling, that happens every time you raise the temperature in your mouth, like drinking a cup of coffee. It happens every time you brush it. So whenever you brush your teeth in the morning, you've got all this mercury coming off of it. And so, um, see here we, um, if you, here you can see the mercury coming, right? So, uh, and then, of course, one of the worst things is to have somebody drill on your teeth or when you go to the dentist's office and they begin to clean your teeth and they're polishing in there, you have huge amounts of, well, look at that, all that mer mer mercury coming right off your fillings. So one of the problems with teeth is that if you have mercury fillings, you're getting poisoned with the mercury. But there's another problem, and that is that here you see a mercury filling in dentists traditionally remove at least a third and then you can see in this tooth all over a half of the tooth with what are called undercuts just so that mercury filling won't fall out. So they removed a large portion of your tooth to put a filling in. Well eventually the tooth fractures and usually it goes down the side and then the dentist will come along and put a crown right on top. So now you have mercury leaking into an open wound and yet the dentist can never see it because his x-ray won't go through the crown so he x-rays and said all things look beautiful. Okay, so you've got all of this mercury going into your system underneath there. But the important thing to know is that every tooth is wired into an acupuncture circuit. So whatever happens to that tooth happens to the organs that are on that same circuit. So for example, there are some people who have, uh, have published that uh, all breast cancers are associated with an infection in one of these tooth. You see this where it says right breast? So it's this upper right molar or the, the, the one of these two molars or this premolar. On the other side it's over here. It also, the breast, is these bottom teeth. I've seen one breast cancer in which I couldn't find a dental connection to it. Okay? So almost all women with breast cancer will have infection in these teeth. Okay? So somebody uh, was talking to me uh, earlier about uh, uh, a family member that has pancreatitis. Well, if you've got pancreatitis uh, and you've got normal total body voltage, guess what's probably causing the pancreatitis? See where it says pancreas? See where it says pancreas? So you've got an infection in one of those teeth. That's why your pancreas is flared up. And the reason is that the kind of bug that's able to have lunch on a tooth of all things puts out a really severe toxin called uh, gliotoxin or thioether. If it's a bacteria, it's a thioether. If it's a fungus in there, it's called a gliotoxin. So what you see is, um, well, let's go back.
to this. This is the problem. You see this crown looks pretty good, and the dentist will say, oh, that's a beautiful crown. And you say, well, yeah, but it kind of aches every once in a while. Oh, nothing wrong with that tooth. The x-rays look fine until you take it off. Surprise what's under there, right? Now, remember, when you go to the dentist and you tell them you want all of the mercury taken out of your mouth, be sure that they give you an air supply because you saw those fumes coming off, particularly if they're drilling on them. So if, if the dentist doesn't protect you by giving you an air supply, then as those fumes come out of your own mouth, they'll go into your nose and into your brain, and you'll come out of there feeling terrible, and it's a hard problem getting mercury out of your brain. So don't do that. Don't allow a dentist to be grinding on a silver filling without giving you an air supply. And I like to even put those little cotton balls in there so I'm sure it's not I'm going to have any of that mercury go up my nose and into my brain. And you want them to use what's called a rubber dam. A rubber dam is just a sheet of plastic that they poke a tooth through so that any pieces that fall down are captured by this and you don't swallow them. So before you have any dental work, call your dentist's office and say, when you work on my teeth, will you give me an air supply and use a rubber dam? And if they say, oh, that's not important, go find another dentist, okay? Now, a root canal is uh, one of the worst things of all because a root canal is a dead tooth. The way you do a root canal is you drill a hole in the top here, you put this auger down, and you rip the artery and nerve out and kill the tooth. The dentists are the only physicians who purposely leave dead tissue in the body because everybody knows that dead tissue gets infected. So if your big toe dies and I don't amputate it, you're going to die from gangrene, aren't you? If your appendix dies and you don't amputate it, you're going to die from peritonitis. If your tooth dies and you don't amputate it, it just takes longer to do you in, but it will. Here's a study that actually comes from the root canal doctor's own uh, journal, the Journal of Endodontics. And this was a study uh, where they had people who are going to have wisdom teeth pulled. And so they did a root canal on one side and then waited three months and then pulled both teeth. Now, molars contain uh, up to three miles of these little tubules. You see the little tubules in here? Well, this tooth they didn't do anything to. One percent of the tubules were infected. This one that had a root canal three months earlier 39% of the tubules are infected in just three months, okay? Now, this study was done at the University of Kentucky, and it shows that one root canal tooth shuts down 63% of your immune system, okay? So, so one of the worst things you can do is to go around with an abscess in your mouth called a root canal because you don't feel it because the nerve's not there anymore, right? But it's sitting there putting out these uh, thioethers, shutting down your immune system. So that's why, uh, the, and, the, and the, it, it does the general immune system, but it'll also take down the voltage in whatever circuit it's in. And that's why oftentimes some, like I had a woman come in to see me from Carolina and she had such severe pain in her upper back that she was on Oxycontin. She'd been all over the place, had neurologists and MRI scan. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with her, but she had all this pain, so she came in the Oxycontin. And she said, you've got to do something for me. She said, I can't stand the pain without it, and I can't function with it. So I looked at where she was hurting, and it was where the perineural system goes out to the lung. So I looked in her mouth. <clears throat> and this tooth right here was discolored and had a huge mercury filling in it. And when I put a voltmeter on it, it was leaking more than 200 millivolts. Well, you shouldn't be leaking more than 30 millivolts out of a tooth. And so I told her that her back pain was coming from that tooth. Well, she thought my cheese had slipped off the cracker and refused to go to the dentist. Well, it took me three days to finally condense her to go. And eventually, when she went to the dentist, as soon as he put the block in to numb that tooth, the back pain was gone. He took the filling out, cleaned out the infection, put a different, you know, a new filling back in that wasn't mercury, and that was the end of her back pain. So a lot of back pain comes from having a dental problem. And you see the same thing with almost every other illness. People come in with Crohn's disease. Well, it's because they got a tooth in the, in the intestinal meridian. They come in with heart problems. Well, they got infection in the same area. So basically, I have personal experience with this. When I was sick, I had a bleeding disorder. My platelet count was running 40,000. It should be around 150 to 350,000. And I had a root canal in my spleen meridian, this number 14 right here. So my spleen was killing all my platelets because of the root canal right here. Well, 
one of the interesting things is that one of the things, remember, that I couldn't do is think. Remember, I had only two or three hours a day in which I could think clearly because my brain was running at two millivolts instead of 25? Well, the spleen meridian takes voltage to the brain. So 48 hours after I had this tooth pulled, my bleeding problem was cured. My platelet count went back to 150,000 in 48 hours. And my brain started working again. Well, my kids uh, sometimes and my staff uh, argue with about whether that's really true, but <clears throat> at least I'm working better than I used to. So the point is that a single tooth can take you down. A single root canal put me in bed for seven years. Okay? So, so I can't over overemphasize to you how important I think uh, dental infections are because uh, probably 70, well, almost everybody who comes to see me in my office has been sick for five or ten years and can't figure out how to get well. And about 70% of the people who walk in my door, they're sick because of their teeth. And so the teeth is something you really have to pay attention to. And so uh, the real problem is finding a dentist who understands this stuff because they don't teach this in dental school. And uh, so it's hard to find a dentist who knows anything at all about acupuncture. Now, here's, um, I don't know if you can see, if the lights are dim enough, you can see this or not, but I hope so. This used to be a root canal in here, and you see all of this, this infected bone. A problem with leaving a root canal in your mouth very long is that the infection in the tooth pretty soon walks its way out into the bone. And once you get infection in the bone, it's really much harder to get rid of because you can't just pull the tooth. You've got to go out and clean out all of that infected bone in your jaw and that's an even bigger job and then it tends to come back so it's a hard thing to do so the longer you wait before getting your root canals all out the more difficult it's going to be to get it fixed here you can see some of the of how the infection has gone out and just spread through the jaw now this is uh, George Meinig Dr. Meinig is the dentist who invented the root canal procedure and um, he spent most of the last years of his career trying to get dentists to quit doing them. And he wrote this book called Root Canal Cover-Up. So if you, if you want to know more about what I've been telling you about, you can get Dr. Meinig's book from Amazon or other similar places. Well, I think I've probably talked longer than I was supposed to. I apologize if I kept you too long. Um, what I've tried to tell you is that uh, that Getting sick is about losing voltage, and getting well is about regaining our voltage so we have enough electrons to build new cells. And of course, we have to have the raw materials to build those new cells, and that's where nutrition comes in. And you have to get rid of the toxins that are hanging around because if you're loaded up with toxins, then when you build a new cell, those toxins just poison that cell as well. So getting well is a combination of fixing your voltage to getting doing good nutrition which is getting harder and harder to do because of our food supply and uh, detoxing and the the thing that's so nice is that we now have a way to measure your voltage and know what's going on uh, and it, you know when you try to do things without measuring then you're flying by the seat of your pants so um, you know, I love to use the biomodulator because I can measure with it. I love to use it to put electrons in. Sometimes I use essential oils. Sometimes I use homeopathics. Uh, uh, sometimes I use the, the Tesla lights. Sometimes there are all sorts of stuff that I use and because anything that will donate electrons has the potential of solving the problem. If, you, you know, if you've got a 90-year-old whose total body voltage is 25 and doesn't have any you know very many all the other circuits are all right except just a couple of teeth they'll be fine because they've got enough voltage to deal with it right so your normal voltage is what, like a 20, 20 to 25. 25 so but if you've got a 40 year old whose total body voltage is five that person's going to have uh, you have to worry about that person having problem having their tooth uh, pulled or anything else done because if you go in and start killing bugs in that uh, person, uh, for example, there's a product I love called uh, MMS or sodium chloride because it'll kill any virus, bacteria, anything you can think of, it'll kill it shortly. 
But if you give that to somebody who's got a total body voltage of five, you'll put them in bed because they can't deal with all those dead bugs. All right? Same thing would happen if I gave the, uh, the wrong homeopathic to that person. If they got a total body voltage of five and I start doing detox stuff with homeopathics, I'll put them in bed. So that's why I want to know before I start, what's this patient's voltage? Because then I know how sick they are and how fast I can get them well. Because you can't, you can't start asking the body to clean up stuff if it's got five millivolts. It just can't handle it, right? That's a problem, you know, somebody, let's say um, that, uh, that you're, uh, you're feel feeling bad and your cells uh, are saying, I need more food down here, and so you start eating something and your digestion, uh, your GI tract is running at seven millivolts, it looks up at you and says, what do you think? I'm running at seven millivolts and you're dumping all of this stuff down here you want me to deal with? And what's it going to do? It's going to throw it right back up at you, right? You understand what I just said? You're going to throw up because the stomach says, seven millivolts, I can't deal with this stuff. Back it goes. So by knowing what the voltage is, you know what you can do. Make sense? It's all about the voltage. Any other questions? Well, alkaline water is, by definition, uh, water that is an electron donor. So if you take most of the water out of the earth, put a voltmeter in it, it's an, it has a voltage in it, right? Okay. Then you put chlorine and fluoride in it, it becomes an electron stealer. The problem with fluoride, you can't get it back out. The only filters that take it out put other poisons back in. So once uh, the government puts the fluoride in the water, there's really no effective way to get it back out. So the best you can do for that is to take enough iodine so your body will help dump it out and just try not to take more of it in than you have to. So, uh, but what you want from water is you want it to be clean. You don't want to have bugs and dirt and stuff in it. And you don't want it to have toxins in it. And you want it to have electrons. You want it to be an electron donor. Now the easiest way to, uh, to get water that's acceptable, in my opinion, is to use uh, one of the ionic uh, machines. And there are several of those. Most all of them are made in the same basic way. There are uh, people here I saw that are uh, displaying one brand of them. It's an MLM company and they're about four grand. You can get an almost identical machine where for about a thousand dollars from another company called Jupiter. And that's the one I use because uh, it's so much less expensive and I've tested the water, I've tested all the forms of the water, the voltage, the, uh, the oxidative uh, uh, content, I've, ta uh, I've taken old machines, old Jupiter machines that have been around for a while, taken their water and sent them off to toxicology labs. There's no toxins in them, despite what some people claim. And so I'm perfectly content to spend 25% of as much money <coughs> for the same thing. So I use that device, and you can dial in whatever voltage you want.